For years and years, I struggled for the holy grail of happiness. I mean, I did anything and everything that I could to discover truth for myself. I mean, right in the beginning, I tried self-help books. I, I read a book called The Eight Essential Steps That You Need to Take to Unlock the Seven Keys for the Ancient Secrets <laughs> that would reveal the six essential skills that you need to follow the ten rules of life. <laughs> <laughs> and I must have read a hundred books like this. And none of them did any good. So I, I think need something more experiential. So I always wanted to do, like the work of Tony Robbins. And he promised to give me unlimited power. So I tried to go for the seminar, but it was for a limited time only. So I never re and ended up doing this the, the unlimited power. I just screwed that jump joke, but it's okay. <laughs> now my friends were trying to get me into positive thinking. And my first reaction was, nah, what's positive thinking going to do? <laughs> How is that going to help? What positive thinking going to help with my, my situation? And then all these new agers wanted to get me into astrology. And frankly, I've got to tell you something. Astrology is a lot of crap. It's crap. And you know why I think that? It's because my Mercury is opposite Saturn, <laughs> set with a T-square on Uranus. So for me to think that planets a million freaking miles away are going to influence my behavior is frankly a lot of bullshit. It's because of the T-square that makes me feel it. That's why I was never good in bhakti yoga. In bhakti yoga, you have to be fully devotional. You have to be devotional to God. You have to surrender to God. So I told my guru, yeah, I'll surrender to God, pal. But I don't want to surrender my way, okay? I'm not going to surrender your way. I'm going to surrender on my terms, not your terms. Needless to say, I was not very good at bhakti yoga. <laughs> I mean, I'm such a believer in free will, you know? I mean, free will makes the world go around. I mean, you have to believe in free will. You have no choice. <laughs> because I was believed in free will, I became an atheist. <clears throat> I couldn't really prove that God didn't exist. I just had to accept it on faith. <laughs> I tell you though, those were some very dark days when I was an atheist. Uh, I was really got into a depression. And I tell you, I thank God for Zoloft. Because that really, really was a big help. But I had to get out of atheism. There were no holidays. <laughs> it was no fun. Atheism was just no fun. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so that's when I decided to try Landmark. Landmark Education. And Landmark is a great company, but they have this funny language. They're always saying, I got it. You know? I'd meet my friend Eddie in a seminar. I'd go, Eddie, how are you? He'd go, I got it. You're asking how I am. <laughs> he says, I'm fine. How are you? I'd say, oh, I got it. You're fine. <laughs> and, you, and you want to know how I am. I got it. I'm good. He said, you're good. I got it. <laughs> so I, I finally got disgusted with this. I went, years later, I went to a seminar leader. I said, you know, I've had it with this got it stuff. He says, you've had it. I got it. <laughs> I said, you got that I've had it? He says, yeah, I got that you've had it. I said, wow, I got that you got it. So this plunged me deeply into therapy. Right away I said, I gotta figure, I gotta figure who the heck I am. So <clears throat> right away, my therapist told me. You got to get this. <clears throat> he said, your problem, one of your problems, is that everybody, you're suffering from infantile grandiosity, and at the same time, you're recoiling from your spiritual enormity. <laughs> I said, what the frick does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, 
It means that your inner child is a freaking crybaby. <laughs> he said also, by the way, he, he told me not to, he told me to stay away from non-duality because I was bipolar. <laughs> and not only, and not only that, not only that, he said that I was a tamasic, rajasic, schizophrenic because I procrastinated immediately. <laughs> I mean, uh, because I was a schizophrenic, he charged me double. <laughs> this, guy, this guy was not so, this guy was not so good himself. Don't think that he, there was something wrong with him. He said, come back to my office next Thursday and the four of us will discuss your problem. <laughs> so I come, back next, I come back next Thursday and the first question he asks, he says, what other problems are you, what other personalities are you hiding from me? And so my first response was, none of your goddamn business. I, I said, hey. <clears throat> he said, you don't understand. It's my business to know everything about you. This way, I'll be able to help you. I said, no, it's, that's not right. I said, it's my business to know that any personality that I reveal, you're going to charge me. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to tell you what, how many personalities I have unless you give me a quantity discount. <laughs> and I said, by the way, if you haven't figured it out, one of my personalities is a businessman. <laughs> he said, listen, don't worry about the fee. What I'm going to be able to do for you is to remove all your personalities. And that, in fact, is priceless. I said, well, now you talk. Because if you remove all my personalities, there'll be no one left to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, all right, I'll leave the business room. I said, no, 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 you better also leave the lawyer, because then we can settle the bill out of court. <laughs> So I realized I had, to, I had to get away from this kind of therapy situation. I had to get more spiritual. So I started getting into mindfulness. And while I'm in a bookstore, I, my hand reaches on a book by John Kabat-Zinn called Wherever You Go, there you are. Feel it, there, you are. There, you are. there You Are, exactly. Wherever you go, there you are. And I didn't even open the book, but the title mesmerized me. I was captivated. I said, wow, this is like an epiphany. <laughs> this is the equivalent of E equals MC squared to physics. I said, this is flawless. Try to disprove that wherever you go, where, there you are. So I said, well, let's see. Wherever I went, that's, that's where I was. Not only that, but wherever I will go, that's where I will be. I said, you know, this is what I've been looking for all my life. I start going to the computer. I want to find out what's the next retreat that John Kabat-Zinn is doing so I can study with him. And as I'm Googling on the computer, I start thinking, you know, wherever I go, I'm not all there. <laughs> and when I go and come back, what am I? Here or there? <laughs> so, so, I, so before registering, I, I, that night I, I said, I'm going to sleep on it. That night I went to bed and I had an astral travel experience. And I traveled everywhere. I went to Russia, I traveled to Antarctica, I traveled to Africa, traveled, even traveled to Brooklyn, New York. And when I woke up, I was still in my bed. Wherever I went, I never left. <laughs> So a few days later, I was in New York City, I'm walking down Fifth Avenue, and down, walking towards me is this guy, he must have weighed 800 pounds, and he's walking like this, and I'm thinking, you know, wherever this guy goes, he's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so shortly after, I had to, nature's call hit me really bad, and I had to run into a bathroom in Starbucks. And while I'm in the bathroom, I said, you know, I really have to go. I'm not going over there. I'm going right here where I am right now. So when I go, I go here. I don't go there. So I realized that this whole premise of John Kabat-Zinn does not work. It's, 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 it's fallacious. So I just decided that wherever John Kabat-Zinn goes, I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but the good thing about this is that the mindfulness got me into Buddhism. And that, and that was very, very enlightening. You see, Buddhists believe that all life is suffering, which is why you don't find a lot of Buddhists at parties. <laughs> <clears throat> because Buddhists believe that life is suffering, they feel that the more you suffer, the more motivated you are to attain your Buddha nature. So I decided to write a book for Buddhists to help them suffer. <laughs> so I wrote a book called Taking Your Life from Bad to Worse. Come on, you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and the book is about the book goes into uh, into the fact that you may have relationship problems, you may have problems with your wife or your partner, you may have money problems, you may have problems at your job, you may have family problems with your parents or with your children, you may feel stress, you may feel tension, you may feel fatigue. I said, but if you look really, really deep into your life, you'll discover you probably have some serious health problems that you are not aware of. <laughs> the Buddhists, see, Buddhists feel that the whole problem with the individual is the ego. They feel that we're standing in our way. In fact, that the ego is the enemy. So I stopped masturbating. Because <laughs> I realized I was sleeping with the enemy. <laughs> And I decided that I was going to get rid of my ego. It was for purely selfish reasons, I can assure you. So to get rid of my ego, I went to a Zen monastery. And this was a, an amazing Roshi who was running this monastery. His name was Roshi Hiram Rabinowitz. <laughs> this Roshi was absolutely amazing. His concentration was impeccable. Roshi Rabinowitz, in the middle of the morning, two in the morning, would take his meditation cushion and rush to the leading department store in the area and put it by the front entrance, and he would sit still for sometimes five or ten hours just waiting for suits to go on sale. <laughs> he was always the first one in the store. He was amazing. And he always said things to me that, that somehow made me stop and think. He said things like, Elliot, you know, once you realize you can change who you are, you'll never be the same. <laughs> and any time he said that, I would do like a Tibetan meditation. I try to assimilate the meaning of what he's saying. Many days later, he said, you know, Elliot, once you realize you've never left, you can't go back. Oh, don't you know? This Roshi, this Roshi was, he had many techniques. One of his techniques was a mantra that he created. It was, Om Mane Padme Oi. <laughs> but you have to say it the right way. It's like, Om Mane Padme Oi. Om <laughs> Very powerful. But his main technique was the koan. What he would have is everyone would be sitting in the zendo, in zazen meditation. And one by one, he would call you into a study to see if you, it was true that you had attained the Buddha nature. So everyone's meditating in zazen. He calls me in. And he, he says, does a dog have a Buddha nature? And right away, with no mind, I said, <laughs> Several days later, we're all meditating. He calls me in. He says, what is the sound of one hand clapping? So I smacked him. <laughs> he went, awesome. So the next time he calls me in, 
And he just sat still for about a minute. And he goes, Whoosh. I went, <laughs> I went, awesome. Awesome. And finally, he calls me in. And he says, this is the test. He goes, the elephant flies backwards. <laughs> But the sparrow has whooping cough. <laughs> so I kissed him on the lips. He smacked me in the face. I punched him in the nose. He kicked me to groin. I gave him a rabbit chop to his side. And then we... <laughs> and as I bowed, I realized I was bowing out because this is getting too violent. <laughs> so I gave up Buddhism. And that's when I discovered Eckhart Tolle. Oh. Thank God I didn't have to get kicked in the grind by studying Eckhart. Eckhart was very, very positive. He wanted to be in the present moment. Always be present. So I tried following Eckhart. And I realized it's hard to be in the present moment. Who has that kind of time? <laughs> so I devised a way to... Not always be in the present moment. I would be five minutes present. And then I would be five minutes absent. So five minutes I would be present. And then five minutes I would be absent. But it wasn't working because when I was present, I would, my mind would wander and I'd be absent. And when I was absent, I'd go, oh, I'm absent. Oh, no, no, I'm present. So I finally worked out and mastered this technique. And I wrote a book about it called Be Absent Now, <laughs> which I'm still waiting to get on the bestseller list, but it's, it's, it's moving up. It's moving up. So once I got into Eckhart Tolle, I started getting involved with all these non-dual teachers. And there was a, went to a satsang with a non-dual teacher called Rupert Spira. Now Rupert Spira is very analytical. He was a sculptor or something, or artist, but he, he's very analytical. You wouldn't know that he was an artist from how he talks. So he goes something like, he goes, when you see the cup in my hand, is the cup in my hand, or is it in my, my mind? I said, I said, wow. I said, that's a really good insight. He says, when you say that this is a really good insight, you're using your tongue and your mouth and your jaw to verbalize the words. Is the sound in your mouth or is the sound in your mind? I said, wow, this is, this is really something. He goes, when you say that this is really something, is the language going through the air, causing vibrations, or is this all happening in your mind? I said, Rupert, it's getting late, it's time for lunch. You got a break. He goes, when you put food in your mouth and you are tasting the food, is the food in your mouth or is it in your mind? I go, Rupert, let me ask you a question. Where is your ass? He goes, where is my ass? Is my ass below my waist and above my thighs? Or is my ass in my mind? <laughs> I said, Rupert, that's great. Where is your mind? Is it in your skull? Or is it up your ass? <laughs> I like Rupert. Rupert's a great guy. He was study with Francis, Francis Lucille. He was a great guy. But I realized that non-duality was something that permeated my whole life. I mean, even when I was a kid, my father would go, Elliot, make your dad proud. Go disappear. 